The following program was brought to you in part by the California State Railroad Museum. We wanted it to be uh, one of the greatest trains in the nation. I viewed the daylight to be sort of a signature for the Southern Pacific. These scenes represent passenger trains that have traveled over the Southern Pacific's coastline route. They span the years between 1937 and 1971, when Amtrak took over the service. Hello, I'm Michael Gross. Welcome to the Daylight, the most beautiful train in the world. Few railroads match the scenery or equal the quality of service provided on the Daylight. It was truly a unique train with a glorious history. The train's history can be traced back to 1933 when Southern Pacific's president, Angus MacDonald, very confidently called a meeting of his top executives and declared, Even though things look bad, the Depression isn't going to last forever. At that point, MacDonald thrilled his staff with a dream to build the finest and most beautiful streamlined passenger train ever designed. By 1935, the rough design for this new train had been completed, but the country was still in the grip of an economic depression. Many people were hungry and without jobs. Business and industry had been ravaged by the depression, and recovery seemed agonizingly slow to manifest itself. Although American railroads were still carrying the majority of intercity passengers and freight, shrunken revenues precluded almost all planned improvements or innovative changes. Yet Southern Pacific's 12th president, Angus MacDonald, envisioned and implemented the construction of a new train, which would deservedly be known as the most beautiful train in the world. Innovative planning and design work produced many firsts from the Southern Pacific's talented team. Passenger comfort, safety, and attention to the total ambiance was their objective, all stunningly achieved with the daylight. For this train, Southern Pacific used nothing but the finest in materials. Southern Pacific was always very picky about the cars that the manufacturers, Pullman Standard Manufacturing Company and the Bud Company, very picky about the equipment that they made for us. And we had people in their uh, shops back east uh, monitoring the construction of the cars and to make sure that they were a nice smooth size, no wrinkles in the covering for the sidewalls. We wanted it to be uh, one of the greatest trains in the nation, and it was. In record time, the Pullman Standard Company provided two sets of the 12-car train. The daylight truly set the standard for railroads which were entering the streamlined era. The motive power was similarly researched. The result was the extraordinary GS-484 steam locomotive that more than matched the beauty of the train in appearance and performance. It's important to note that passengers had been served on the coastline route before the daylight. There were standard heavyweight trains, such as the Shoreline Limited, which began in 1906, the Daylight Limited, which started in 1922, and the Daylight of 1927. Early in January 1937, Southern Pacific decided upon a new approach to advertising with the daylight. They went on the premise that seeing is believing. Brian Thompson explains. The trains go into service. But before uh, that, the advertising campaign that took place was awesome. Here for just an hour stop in Oakland, California, we had this ad. Now this came out of the Oakland Tribune. Here comes the new daylight on exhibition, Oakland, 9 to 10 a.m. in the morning. So they spent this whole page telling about the train. And this did not give the people a clue, despite these, the deadmit of the seats, the illustrations. It didn't give them a clue of exactly what they were going to experience on the train. And this really established a desire and a want to travel. The trains went into service and, you know, the rest of its history. 
the schools at that time were also looking for programs and entertainment. And uh, they had a couple, a woman and a man, that would come to schools for in their assemblies. And the school I had, we the auditorium seated 1,400 people. And they all came in there to see this film. They showed the film of the train. And the woman was actually in the uniform of the stewardesses from the city of San Francisco. Sort of a pearl gray skirt and coat and a little bouncy cap. And she and this representative of the company would sit up at the table and answer questions of it. And when the program was over, they gave each school a roll of prints, non-detailed prints, but outlines of every car on the train, the locomotives, the tenders and all for use in the mechanical drawing classes for kids to make their own drawings from it, stripe them the way they wanted. And no matter where they went, they were hit with daylight, daylight, daylight was through the whole thing. It was just an incredible promotion. In spite of rainy weather in several cities during the exhibitions, a record 153,535 persons filed through the train in the 12 days that it was open to the public. While the weather may not have been sunny during the 12 city tour, the colors of the train brightened everyone's enthusiasm. Usually conservative railroad management took a bold step with daylight colors. What did the colors represent? The red, orange, black, and silver were, were so vivid and so unrelated to a train. I, I, I guess as a child, I must have thought, well, gee, this must be the circus train that's pulled in. But. Uh, uh, I didn't know what to make of it. It, it, it was just so different uh, from, from any other train I'd ever seen. The glow of uh, California, the orange and the, uh, the orange-red combination, uh, I think just represented uh, the whole spirit of, of California and the, and, the, and the West Coast. The idea was that against the blue ocean and the blue sky and all the green hills and mountains that they really needed something that would stand out. One of the color schemes that was presented was the red and the orange. I think from what I've picked up maybe kind of between the lines that a lot of the staid older executives thought that was really garish. The daylight's color scheme was just so absolutely uh, striking. And uh, it, it, it looked like as it would go down the tracks, it just these with red, orange, and black color. And it was all tied together because the cars, they weren't solidly connected, but they had sort of a skirt tying the cars together. So it, it just blended as one streak. Those trains, like the Super Chief, they used diesels. The Daylight really had the steam locomotive. They used the steam locomotive until, I think, about 1955. In 1937, the Southern Pacific received from Lima Locomotive Works the first six of 32 streamlined locomotives. These 484-type locomotives were designed for use on the new daylight train to be inaugurated between San Francisco and Los Angeles. Bill Cratville provides some history about these new locomotives. Well, the daylight assigned locomotives where the GS2 started with the GS2 class. Uh, actually, the type followed the GS1 general service. In fact, that's what the GS originally stood for. And then they applied the term, uh, as I understand it, Golden State. But the uh, 484 had been developed around 1930. But the daylight locomotives were specifically designed uh, for the service intended, uh, the, the uh, speeds that they operated, the distance. Uh, everything about it was a new 484 design. And uh, one of the men in charge of that was Paul Guerin, and I became good friends with Paul Guerin through the years, uh, particularly starting about 1960 or so. And uh, he was the chief designer uh, in the background for that uh, streamlined daylight locomotive with the design for the cowling and so forth. 
costing approximately $136,000 each. These new 5,000 horsepower locomotives, along with their fully loaded tenders, weighed over 800,000 pounds. Yet they could run at a top speed of 90 miles per hour. The total cost for one complete train was over $2 million. The locomotives were designed to maintain the train schedule over a maximum grade of 2.2%, including grades of 1% over a large part of the run. These new, colorful engines were about to make their debut on a train that was to mark a new standard for American passenger trains. One of Southern Pacific's finest hours came on Sunday, March 21st, 1937, when twin streamlined daylights were launched into service. A new chapter in the annals of railroad history began. The ceremonies commenced at 7 a.m. in both San Francisco and Los Angeles with NBC carrying the event live to the nation. Under rainy skies, the NBC announcer asked President McDonald what he thought of the new daylight. His reply to the listening audience was, The important thing is what the public is going to think of it. We think they'll like it. Certainly we built it to meet their demands for speed, with safety and comfort, and what you might call eye appeal. Someone has called these trains rainbow trains. In Los Angeles, the moment of departure for the million-dollar train was drawing near. Lovely Miss Olivia de Havilland, star of Warner Brothers Studio, stepped to the microphone. May you have a safe and speedy journey. With this bottle of California champagne, I christen you the daylight. Good luck and Godspeed. In San Francisco, the daughter of Vice President J.H. Dyer, Miss Laureen Dyer, with a bottle of champagne poised, declared, I christen this beautiful train the daylight. May she have many smooth runs on time, and may she give enjoyment and comfort to many people. Then, at exactly 8.15 a.m., engineer Charlie Glass in San Francisco and engineer W.W. W. Judy in Los Angeles released the brakes and opened the throttles of their new streamlined locomotives. The two spick-and-span 12-car trains glided smoothly, almost noiselessly, from the station platforms and began their journey of 471 miles. This new streamlined daylight replaced a heavyweight train of the same name. They both operated on the 471-mile coastline route between Los Angeles and San Francisco. Aside from the name and train numbers, 98 and 99, the new streamliner borrowed little from its heavyweight predecessor. Charles Eggleston, the designer for Southern Pacific's daylight train, chose the unforgettable red, orange, and black color scheme. This lustrous new train featured state-of-the-art design and interior accommodations. Southern Pacific pulled out all the stops for the advertising of the new train. SP was outstanding in their advertising. No question that they were a leader in the railroad industry. And one of their best trains, of course, was the Coast Daylight. And they advertised it as being able to see miles of continuous Pacific Ocean scenery, stretching from a point uh, below San Luis Obispo all the way to Ventura. To me, that was a leading factor in the success of the train. In my Western Pacific days at California Zephyr, one of our biggest sellers was the station in Santa Barbara because they would put them on and you'd have three days of scenery all the way back to Chicago. Now the SP in their, in their glory days, they had a marvelous advertising department and we in the industry admired everything they did. The Southern Pacific Railroad uh, uh, in the era uh, actually was spent a lot of money advertising uh, uh, their trains. They had uh, placards even on the San Francisco cable cars. They had billboards along the freeway, which uh, the, I believe the, uh, the wording of the billboard was, next time, take the train. They were really anxious uh, to, uh, to try to keep people riding the rails. In the late 30s, when the idea was uh, conceived to have a flagship and have a train with all the modern facilities, the advertising program was very much in evidence, and we had a 
advertising manager name of Treadway, and we used radio at that time and magazines and every imaginable way to advertise the train, and I think it really paid off dividends. My first impression of the daylight was uh, one of being almost uh, startled. It was so absolutely beautiful. At the time, we were living down in uh, Belmont uh, and were on top of a hill, and we could look down and see the train when it would go by in the morning. It would come by our, uh, through Belmont about 20 minutes to uh, 9 o'clock, and then on, its, on the northbound, it would uh, basically come by about 5.30 in the afternoon. So it was really quite magnificent, uh, the vibrant colors and uh, the air horn. It was quite, quite spectacular, quite a train. Makeup of the train originally was changed subsequently, and originally it had a parlor car in addition to the observation lounge. The parlor car attendant was a woman. It was a black woman who wore a maid's outfit, the black dress and the white apron. A boy that I went to school with, his mother was one of those people that worked the train. I was a railroad enthusiast at a very early age. I, I blame it on my parents who gave me a toy train around the Christmas tree at probably age uh, five. And so to see that bright and sparkling train there at San Francisco was a glorious sight. It wasn't just a billboard, but it was like a, a 700 or 800 foot long, uh, bright, impressive train, a bright billboard for Southern Pacific. And it was a pretty impressive sight when you were less than 10 years old. The reputation, of course, of the Coast Daylight was one uh, marvelous one, and uh, it was the color of the train was so fantastic, and the scenery along the route through the mountains and along the coast uh, down below Surf, California, was just made it a very popular train for tourists. While many new streamlined passenger trains were launched in the late 1930s, how was the daylight different from all the others? Bob Jochner explains why many called the daylight unique. In the late 1930s, management was very enthusiastic and uh, wanted to operate a train that was a flagship for the company. And they spared no expense in advertising the train and making innovations as far as equipment was concerned and also as far as the service on the train was concerned. Innovations uh, such as uh, the outside baggage elevators, which was an innovation, and services such as we checked baggage right from the train to a taxi stand in San Francisco and Los Angeles. And anything that uh, we knew that could be done at that time, the, the company went ahead and uh, took care of it. I viewed the daylight to be sort of a signature for the Southern Pacific. Um, it made a statement. Uh, remember, in the late 30s, we were coming out of the Depression. And uh, in the 40s, we were going through the war years. And uh, I, I think it made a statement about the railroad and uh, sort of expressed with these bright colors, I think hope, optimism, uh, good things about the future to come. During the first 11 days of operation, the new train carried over 4,000 passengers northbound and over 3,700 southbound. The daylight was timed to be convenient, leaving both ends at 8.15 and completing the run by 6 p.m. In the early years, the train was often sold out. By 1939, the daylight was officially the most heavily traveled single-section intercity train in the country. The sizable initial capital investment was returning a handsome profit, too. The, the daylight trains uh, uh, were one of the highest revenue producers uh, for the Southern Pacific. In fact, one of the highest revenue producing trains in the country. 
the tavern car was where everybody congregated. Uh, it was the money maker. In fact, that one car alone paid for the entire expense, operating expense of the daylight every single day in the late 1930s, the 40s, although they did remove the tavern car during World War II because the government said it was a non-essential car. Uh, when it went back into service, it picked up right where it left off, made money. For the first few years, it, it actually made more money than any other train on, on any railroad uh, in this country. And uh, it was so popular that uh, they obviously, you know, you couldn't accommodate all the people on it. So that's finally they had to go to a, a morning daylight and a noon daylight in order to accommodate all the people. Along with state-of-the-art equipment at the time, the Daylight's passengers received plenty of friendly, courteous, personal attention. The cars all had porter and maid service. The maids gave particular attention to the comfort of women and children. Each train required a crew of 45 people for each trip. In addition to the regular train crew, there was an onboard passenger agent. Bob Jockner explains his duties. It was a real pleasure working on the train. I mean, the people that rode the train were were happy with the equipment and happy with the service. And uh, it was certainly a wonderful operating experience for me. And, and primarily as a train passenger agent, the public relations feature, because we, part of our duties were, were to help the conductor collect transportation and arrange for the seating of passengers and handling the passengers' uh, travel needs beyond the destination of the train, making hotel uh, suggestions. And even at that time, of course, there were no cell phones. We even took Western Union and took from people and just dispatched them at the station and so forth. So all in all, it was a very, I worked all of the, the coast uh, daylight and the San Joaquin and the Shasta and uh, all, of all the trains. It was, it was my pleasure. It was always being on the coast daylight. One thing that we were asked to do as train passenger agents, in fact, we were told to do it. Uh, put a smile on your face as you walk through the train and keep it there, even though the thing was causing all sorts of troubles. And we'd have air conditioning problems at times, and if you could come through it and, and, and do something to make it work, make it better, sometimes you couldn't always do it right away, but uh, let's, let's take care of it and, and smile again. Don't laugh at them, don't be facetious about it but uh, it, it went a long way in keeping them happy. Root of the missions. No train trip in the world is more beautiful than the ride along the Pacific. The Coast Daylight route follows the romantic El Camino Real. Known as the King's Highway, it linked the chain of California missions. Here are a few memories from those who rode the train. I would say the daylight route for a daytime train was probably one of the most um, uh, appealing uh, that you could have, being that it went along the uh, Pacific Ocean for 113 miles, crossed the uh, San Luis uh, mountain range with spectacular loops uh, and grades, and then it, of course, uh, also uh, uh, came across the Santa Cruz Mountains up near Gilroy. So you had a mixture of grades, mountains, and the ocean. And of course, really back in the 30s when the train was put on, there were still orange groves at, at different locations down around Oxnard and uh, heading towards Chatsworth. It, it also, of course, crossed uh, Santa Susana Pass at the head of uh, the San Fernando Valley. So there, there was a lot of scenery on that train. Young children were also impressed by the journey on America's most beautiful train. Uh, at the time, I was 13 years old and uh, was making a trip by myself from San Francisco to Los Angeles to visit a friend of mine that was a schoolmate. And uh, 
My parents had arranged for me to be able to sit in the parlor observation car, the last car of the train, which was very special. And uh, I, what caught my attention when I first saw that particular train that I was going to be on was how clean it was. And uh, one of the things they did is the, uh, the, the wheels underneath and everything were all painted freshly black. I mean, it was really very sparkling and uh, quite impressive. And the parlor observation car was just really a knockout because the, uh, you had seats, one seat on either side, and rows that would turn 360 degrees. And at the very end of the observation car, you had about six stationary seats that you could move around a little bit, but they didn't do the 360. And uh, I thought that was so, was so exciting to be able to ride in the back of the train there and see all the goings on. And then the, I used to like to get up and walk to uh, the dining car, have uh, breakfast and have uh, lunch, didn't have dinner because the train got in at six o'clock in Los Angeles. And the conductor would let me uh, go to the vestibule area between cars and keep the, keep the vestibule window open and I couldn't look out and uh, was, you know, really enjoy the countryside. It, it was really great. I really enjoyed it. My first trip on the daylight, uh we, uh, we were in the Salinas Valley, and the train stopped. And nobody knew why the train stopped. Uh, we later learned that we hit a uh, truck farmer's truck. And it seemed like a long time. I guess it was about 45 minutes. And uh, when we finally started moving again, uh, I was amazed at telephone poles going by, boom, boom, boom. And I thought, boy, we were really moving. And when we got into San Francisco, I got off the train, and I was a young, young lad then, and I walked up to the engineer, and I said, how fast were we going? And he looked down at me and said, 99 plus. The engines were uh, balanced at 120 miles an hour. So they were capable of moving the 99. The, riding the daylight was was a very exciting experience as, as a child because I'd never seen a train like that. I I grew up in Orange County. I saw you know other railroads, you know Union Pacific, Santa Fe. But to see the daylight, you know, with the orange and, and red colors and the kind of equipment it had, you know, as as a 10 year old child, it was it was very exciting. Uh, my parents riding from Los Angeles to San Francisco round trip. I rode the daylight starting as a kid back in the, in the 30s when it first started in 37. I had an aunt and uncle who lived in Long Beach and my parents would put me on the train in San Francisco and then I would go to LA and then take the red cars out to Long Beach. But I always made sure when I made a reservation that I had a window seat on the ocean side so that I could see the scenery and also glory in that marvelous 484 steam engine on the head end. Aside from the train itself, it had to have been the scenery. There was such a variety of scenery. When you went down uh, the Central Valley to Salinas, where you could see all the agricultural development, then you went uh, through a little pass there, and you came out uh, at Watsonville. And, um, of course, uh, as you got down farther south, uh, it took... Uh, uh, you had two things. You had, by Ventura, you had, I think it was over 100 miles where you could look right out the window at the ocean. Then uh, there was the climb over Cuesta Grade uh, before you got, I'm talking about southbound now, before you got uh, into uh, San Luis Obispo. And that was uh, very, very scenic. And when you came north on that same grade, it required a helper. Everyone wanted to ride the daylight, I mean, between San Francisco and L.A. I mean, how can I get on the daylight? I don't want to go on the night train. I want to go on the noon daylight, the coast daylight, or the San Joaquin daylight. During the rail journey, public address announcements were often made on the train. Here's an example. 
so that you may better view the spectacular scenery, the train newsstand salesman will be passing through the cars with special Polaroid sunglasses. He will also offer specially designed Southern Pacific daylight playing cards. While the mountains and valleys of the route were beautiful, most passengers would agree that the Pacific Ocean gave them a never-ending series of captivating vistas. The route could be rated as one of the most beautiful train journeys in America. Dave Schumacher shares his thoughts. In some cases, you were uh, literally within, you know, 20 or 30 feet of the coastline. Uh, there was a spectacular trestle at Gaviota. Uh, down there, Santa Barbara, Summerland, and so on, that was uh, beautiful, like tidal pools and so on. And it was, um, on, a, on a good day, you could see the islands, Santa Catalina, those islands out there offshore. Um, uh, that was just one of the scenic highlights of the trip, but it was, uh, I don't know anything else to compare to it. It was in 1949, first time I rode the train, I went from one end of the train to the other, and uh, of course, uh, the porter told me I had to leave the uh, first class section, which I did. The tavern car was really the car where everybody seemed to congregate, but uh, it was a great ride, it was a great thrill. In the early years, the daylight was often filled to capacity. What sort of people rode the train? Oh, I'd say it was probably, uh, probably 75% uh, leisure travel, uh, possibly 25% uh, business travel. Definitely leisure travel was the high percentage of the people on the train. The Hollywood stars used Glendale uh, as a boarding uh, station instead of uh, Central Station or Los Angeles Union Station because of uh, the publicity, they didn't want to have photographers and uh, newsmen there. They would board in secret at Glendale. Uh, some of the great stars, Gary Cooper, Ronald Reagan, Tyrone Power, Olivia de Havilland. In fact, Olivia uh, christened the uh, 1937 daylight at Central Station in Los Angeles. If it's very interesting. Uh Riding a train or flying then, uh, people were a little bit more formal. I mean, everybody wore a suit, coat and tie for gentlemen, and the ladies always had dresses on. And uh, uh, I wouldn't say it was formal, it's just that there was a, uh, a sense of uh, an adventure and that when you were riding in a, a train like the Daylight uh, or flying in an airplane, uh, most everyone was what I would call properly attired. Quite different today. There's a sort of casualness that almost borders, in my judgment, on being a little bit almost disrespectful. The Southern Pacific was not the least bit casual when operating the daylight. At San Luis Obispo, about halfway between Los Angeles and San Francisco, the railroad changed locomotives. Don Olson explains. In the case of uh, San Luis, um, they also changed the power. Uh, the, the, the locomotives that came up from uh, Los Angeles, that's as far as they went. Not that they couldn't go anymore, but that was kind of the generally accepted thing that you kept the power sort of in a pool at home. So those engines would run up to San Louis and back again. And uh, in addition to changing the power, of course, if you were northbound in San Louis, then you had to take a helper on. And uh, originally, the, just as an indication of how um, particular the railroad was, they kept a couple of GS4s, which were the daylight engines, on hand at San Luis Obispo. And they were used there just to carry or to help the train up the grade to quest a summit. And of course, in later years, they still needed help, but they, they used any locomotive that was available. And when you went around the famous horseshoe curve at Gold Tree, the announcement on the train system would say, 
Shortly, your train will be crossing the Santa Lucia Mountains, over which we must pass to enter the Salinas River Valley. The beginning of our ascent is over the famous Horseshoe Curve, where our train will turn 180 degrees to achieve 37 feet of elevation in less than one half mile. You may view this from the right-hand windows of your car. Everybody rushed to one side of the train, so it's a good thing that they're well balanced. They didn't capsize anything. As the Southern Pacific Bulletin said in September of 1937, the daylight continues its pace, not only as the nation's most heavily traveled train, but has established a world's record for passenger train travel. During its first year, the new streamliner carried nearly a quarter of a million passengers. By 1939, the daylight officially became the most heavily traveled single section intercity train in the country, averaging 370 passengers per trip. The handwriting was on the wall. The railroad began planning two more 14 car streamliners to handle the record setting demand. Exclusive of locomotive, the new trains cost nearly a million dollars each. They would be similar to the original sets of equipment, but would contain a number of improvements and refinements. The major improvement would be the introduction of a three-car articulated dining unit. It was made up of a full-length diner and a full-length coffee shop car, along with a full-length kitchen car spaced in the middle. With the introduction of the new trains on March 30th, 1940, came revised names for the daylight. Now there was a morning daylight and noon daylight. We called them the morning daylight once it became two daylights. And the uh, noon daylight merely left at 12 noon and arrived in Los Angeles at an appropriate uh, time, which I think was around nine o'clock. So it offered two services, same equipment, same type of cars, the original train was put on in 1937. They re-equipped it in 39 and transferred the original train to the noon daylight, then re-equipped it once again in 1941 and 2 uh, with new equipment so that they could run the San Joaquin daylight. The coast daylight always got the newest and the best equipment. first daylight because it was so successful. The Southern Pacific then went on later to establish the San Joaquin Daylight Service. Shasta Daylight and so on, and, and actually there were a couple of short streamliners in Texas painted the same colors. They tried to bring the same quality of service to and so on. But really the daylight there was quite, I mean, frankly, uh, 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 it was the flagship and uh, the pride of the SP when the SP had pride. The noon daylight was annulled during World War II and by 1949 a new train took its place. Bill Settle provides some details. The starlight came along and replaced the noon daylight actually. The noon daylight uh, the, pa the patronage was dropping off uh, by this time, and uh, the, the starlight was put on to replace the, the noon daylight because there was a need for coach service of a, of a pretty high quality, and the starlight fit that bill. Before that, it had been sort of a coach, older coach accommodation train with standard sleepers and things of that nature. And there was a companion all first class train called the Lark, which is not part of the, uh, of the daylight series. But which at that time was all Pullman. While the daylights did not offer sleeping car accommodations, the trains did provide a daytime first-class service in the parlor cars. Bill Cratville explains. 
the parlor car was a real treat on that on the daylight because like all parlor cars it had individual swivel chairs uh, of course you had the uh, round end uh, rear end where i used to always try and get the rear seat and look to the rear i don't care what train i'm on if it has an observation car that's what i try but on the uh, daylight it was a completely high class operation even though in later days the rest of the train started to go downhill the parlor car kept its decorum uh, it had an attendant and the attendant was always good i never had a bad trip on the daylight and i rode it many many times while the parlor car provided outstanding service a new car was about to be added it would provide a spectacular way to view the coastline scenery the dome car that was used on the train in later years was perhaps the most spectacular dome car built in that you sat on the standard level and had the dome that was 13 feet above you and that was all clear space and it made for a very striking car and a beautiful lounge facility that's probably the finest dome car that ever came down the pike and it was a home-built car unlike the uh, other railroads have bought their cars from the manufacturers, ACF, Pullman Standard, and Bud. But the full-length dome was designed by the Southern Pacific in their own shops. They started out with the first prototype and that got such a good reaction that they went ahead and built a series to follow. But uh, inside the car, it was uh, like an atrium. Uh, there was a small section between the bar on the lower level and where the stairs went up to the dome in the dome level where you really were like in a greenhouse. And uh, that, uh, I just don't know anything to compare to it. Uh, it was a spectacular piece of equipment. While the new dome cars offered a most pleasurable way to view the passing scenery, another car provided not only viewing pleasures, but fine food as well. Luncheon is being served in the dining car until 3 p.m. And continuous service is available in the coffee shop car. Uh, and there's nothing like eating in the diner uh, while you're traveling along the coastline and looking out at the ocean. Uh, it was just a great thrill. The diner uh, was one of the, I think, the finest pieces of equipment on any railroad. It was a triple unit diner which had the dining car, the center section was the galley, the kitchen, and then the other section was a kind of a lounge car, and it made for very efficient uh, serving uh, the patrons. The food was excellent. Uh, like most trains in those days, they had specialty dishes, and one of the daylight specialty dishes was a wonderful fresh tossed salad. There's no, well, of course, again, I'm kind of prejudiced, but there's nothing like nice snowy linen and sparkly silver and you're having a nice meal watching the scenery go by. The service staff, I remember very fondly, I had uh, one dining car steward in particular, and his name was Fenilator. And uh, he and I, because we went back and forth so much, kind of struck up a relationship. And I remember one time I was going home from school, <clears throat> I believe for Thanksgiving, and so I had a whole bunch of uh, classmates with me on the train, and we all sat down. He happened to be the uh, dining car steward in attendance at that time, and so when it came time for the check to come to the table, the waiter informed me that it was on the house. And my classmates were very <laughs> impressed with, with that. Well, I guess the uniqueness would be the uh, salad bowl, which was featured, and that was one of my favorites right from the start. And it, uh, it was a very generous salad. You call it today a, a regular open salad. And it was very, very economical, by the way. The first time I rode the train, uh, I had a chicken salad sandwich. And uh, I didn't know it at the time, but Southern Pacific had an unwritten rule uh, that the dining car crew uh, should follow. And that was children and person in military uniform would get extra portions and children would always get a free scoop of ice cream. 
And I thought that when uh, the waiter brought my ice cream and I said, I didn't order that. And he said, this is on Southern Pacific. Over the years, the train's equipment had been upgraded. However, a major change took place on January 10th of 1955. Those beautiful steam locomotives that had powered the train since 1937 were removed and replaced with diesel units. The daylight, to me, was a steam streamliner. But when the diesels inevitably came along after World War II, probably around 19. 47, 48, I don't know the exact dates of when they got their Alcos and, and put them on the train. But to me, it did diminish the class of the train. I, I think that was caused by the fact that the train had run from its inception until roughly a decade uh, with nothing but steam, and that steam got a lot of publicity and was well received by the public. So the diesel just to me, just didn't have the same appeal. People along the right of way from Los Angeles to San Francisco started riding Southern Pacific after the diesels were put on and complaining. They said they didn't like the sound of the diesel air horns. They asked if it was possible for Southern Pacific to take the air horns off the daylight engines, the steam engines, and put them on the uh, diesels, which Southern Pacific did. People along the right-of-way used to set their clocks and knew exactly what time it was when they heard the air horn of the uh, steam daylight. And uh, they just got so accustomed to that sound that they didn't like the, the diesel sounds. So Southern Pacific did accommodate the people on that. Beautiful pieces of equipment, but if you were in the railroad industry, much as you loved them, they're expensive to operate. And the diesel, of course, came in as a cheaper alternative. And of course, we were subject to the world's greatest auto salesman, General Motors. One of the engineers who operated these new diesel locomotives was Dan Wolf. Dan explains how important it was to be on time. Yes, it was, and I have a timetable right here from then. And they had a 79 mile an hour track, and you had to make the time, or you had an official that wanted to know the answers where you lost the time on the train. Or if you were on time, they never did say a word then. Two years after the switch from steam to diesel, the daylight celebrated its 20th anniversary. It would be only a few short years from this anniversary that the railroad would take a negative view toward passenger service. Alan DeMoss explains. In the early days, back in the 20s and 30s, uh, first of all, the passenger service was very large and we had a lot of riders. Uh, uh, and there was no serious studies about the cost of operations of the passenger service. In fact, we believed they were losing money even in those days, but we called it cross-subsidization from the freight to the passenger. But it wasn't a big issue because the passenger revenues were very high and it did contribute some cash. Uh, having said that, in the late 50s and all through the 60s, the interstate freeway system was constructed. And in that time, the trucks found out that they were able to divert uh, some of the most important commodities that Southern Pacific hauled. Uh, for example, lumber, which is 20 or 30 percent of our business then, was diverted to trucks. And perishables which is lettuce and strawberries and all the other commodities from the Salinas Valley, they were diverted to trucks. So with this loss of revenue, we began to look around and found out that the uh, passenger trains were taking an enormous amount of cash to operate. And that was the beginning of the program to eliminate the passenger trains.
During the late 1960s, the railroad explored ways to reduce costs. One of the least popular decisions the railroad made was to replace the dining cars. Richard Wright explains. The automat car was the uh, outcome of Southern Pacific removing dining cars from their name trains. The triple unit diner in the winter time had low occupancy and Southern Pacific asked the union that they only wanted to open one wing of, of the triple unit dining car and cut the personnel. The union said no, that they had to operate under the contract, they had to operate a full dining crew for the triple unit diner. Southern Pacific said, well, then we're going to remove the diners and put something in its place. That was the automat car. The president at that time was Donald J. Russell. And he said, try and find a convenient way where there would only require one attendant in the automat car. So the mechanical department searched for something and they said, let's go with vending machines. They said the New York automats were very successful and we ought to just put the same type of equipment in the car. Uh, the first automat car was a daylight car. The rest were ex-sleepers that they rebuilt into automats for each of their name trains. The public did not like that, but the public wasn't eating in the dining car anyway. Mr. Russell said he went aboard all of the trains and he said everybody was packing their lunch. And he said, there's no need to have a dining car anymore. The handwriting was on the wall during the late 1960s. Many trains were being downgraded or simply discontinued. The formation of Amtrak was on the horizon. In fact, on May 1st, 1971, Amtrak took over most of the nation's rail passenger service. When Amtrak was created, uh, the national passenger rail system that was operated by private operators uh, was in pretty bad shape. And uh, when Amtrak started May 1st, 1971, uh, the total number of intercity passenger trains dwindled from about 450 to only about 200 a day. Among those 200 a day was this basic skeletal system, uh, the original a uh, basic system that was put together by the relatively new United States Department of Transportation. Uh, and those basic system trains, uh, many of them are still in place today, including the Coast Starlight, which of course uh, is the, the fabled train that runs between Los Angeles, the Bay Area, and Seattle. The Coast Starlight route was part of the original Amtrak basic system. And uh, now it's been there for well over 30 years. I would like to give some credit to uh, a colleague of mine, Brian Rosenwald, who was given the responsibility to create a special train. To, he was sort of given his lead. Uh, given the reins to do with this train uh, within, you know, the, within budget, uh, something special. And today that train has a great deal of the things that, that Brian put into it. Uh, it is a special train in that it has unique features, features that are unique uh, to long distance passenger trains that Amtrak operates. Uh, perhaps the, the highest profile thing that you that you would notice is uh, that the first class service is truly first class. It, it, it has some special uh, amenities that are not found on other Amtrak long distance trains, including uh, the Pacific Parlor car. The Southern Pacific made a valiant effort to maintain service right to the end. While it did not match the original daylight in level of service, the train certainly provided a journey that would be hard to match on any passenger train in the world. 
Today, a memory of the daylight still exists with the restoration of one of the original locomotives, 4449. It was late by the time I made my first train trip aboard the Coast Daylight, uh, 1967 to be exact. By that time, the Southern Pacific had instituted a number of cost-cutting measures. The coffee shop was gone, the automat service was in its place. But the scenery remained. I still have vivid memories of the wonderful 113 miles of Pacific Coast views. I've ridden a lot of trains over the years, but it was just, just so unique. Everything was unique about that train. I think just the word daylight gave a, an impression to the passenger. Here's a train where I'm going to be able to see scenery all the way from point A to point B. I can describe it in one, in one word. It was super. <laughs>